This is the lecture for Tuesday, uh, November 21st. And uh, I want to start with uh, this slide, and you'll be able to find these slides on Canvas. Um, I want to start with this slide, and then I just have a, a few other notes to get us started in the third part uh, of the class. Um, so we have four more classes left after today, and, and as you know, we'll meet in class again on the um, on the um, uh, 28th. Um, and then our final exam, as it's getting close, is uh, Tuesday, December 12th from 4.30 to 6.30. And again, as a reminder, the final exam is not comprehensive in this class. What we'll do on Tuesday, December the 12th, is just take the part three exam for the class. Uh, the reading and quiz schedule is on Canvas, so make sure you take a look at that. Um, and then again, as you know, paper two is due on the um, on the second. Uh, I'm sorry, on uh, November 30th. And so, um, uh, be sure that you're looking at that. That at, that uh, due date is going to come really quick, and it's going to take uh, take you some time uh, to put that paper together. And uh, both Natalie and I are happy to help if we can help. And so, just uh, to uh, level set us all in terms of where we're at regarding points. We have one quiz left uh, that's worth 20 points. We have uh, in-class assignments, approximately 25 points left there. We have uh, paper number two, which is 100 points, we, and we have exam three, which is 200 points, which leaves us um, about 33% of the um, uh, points left in the class. And so um, almost regardless of where you are, there still are plenty of uh, opportunities to improve your grade. And as I've said in the past, exam three, because it covers a short or a lesser amount of material, um, it's just, uh, there's just less for you to have to uh, uh, go through and to review for as you're preparing for the exam. So I expect that most of you will do better on the third exam than you did on the first and the second exam. So again, if you have any questions regarding this, um, let uh, Natalie or I know. Uh, the reading and quiz schedule is posted on Canvas. Uh, the quiz number six, I'll get that posted here um, um, today. Uh, so you'll be able to finish that easily by Friday, December 8th. Um, and then the next time we're going to be back in class will be uh, a week from today, Tuesday. And we'll continue our... We'll continue our um, We'll continue our work on part three of this class. So we're talking about uh, qualitative research and um, we, we're going to talk some about participant observation, qualitative interviews, social text analysis, and qualitative uh, data analysis. And so um, as we get into each of these chapters, we'll uh, ex particularly chapters 13, 14, and 15, will understand a little bit about each of these qualitative methods. There's lots and lots of details that we potentially could cover. We could take a whole graduate seminar on participant observation, qualitative interviews, or social text analysis. So we'll just barely scratch the surface in terms of our understanding, um, but we will, we will scratch the surface uh, nonetheless. And so... Um, participant observation is the idea where we're just, it, it's, it is what it, the, the title suggests. We are observing the participants that we are interested in studying. Qualitative interviews, as you would expect, they're interviews. Uh, they tend to be in-depth interviews, uh, you know, ranging in length from, you know, 30 minutes to, you know, 90 or more minutes. Uh, interviews are recorded. Uh, verbatim transcribed usually and then that 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 transcript becomes the data that's analyzed social text analysis would be similar to would be the qualitative version of content analysis like we talked about um, like we talked about um, earlier uh, in the the quantitative method section of this class and so it's just a qualitative way of taking any text could be it could be um, employee manuals from uh, from 
the workplace. It could be it could be music. It could be um, any kind of text. And we don't by the by as we've talked before, the idea of text is is um, doesn't mean it has to be something that's printed, something that is that is text per se. We use the word text here in a in a in a um, much more broad uh, sense. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about qualitative data analysis. Uh, and so some review from part one of the class when we're talking about interpretive research and um, remember that the idea of qualitative research and interpretive paradigm, uh, oftentimes we call qualitative research interpretive research. And so we use those terms interchangeably. Uh, so it's made up, uh, again, of participant observation, qualitative interviews, and qualitative text analysis, just slightly different terms than I used on the previous slide. We generally work with non-numeric data. Um, uh, as we talked about before, interpretive researchers believe that the action, that human action, is different from the biological or physical world because we as humans um, are thoughtful and we have this capacity to, to be reflective. And so uh, uh, interpretive or qualitative researchers uh, see this uniqueness that we each have, that we, that we are thoughtful, that we do reflect, and, and that you can't just aggregate and, and summarize data uh, to fully understand um, uh, humans. And so interpretive researchers just approach the problem um, differently. Uh, interpretive researchers uh, see that uh, or understand uh, probably more keenly than quantitative researchers that we each view the world through our own subjective lens. And uh, qualitative researchers are most interested in seeing and describing the world through our eyes. And again, um, I've mentioned this in the past, but if you read good qualitative research, you definitely see this this idea that they're they're hoping to to uh, give understanding to how their participants see the world, uh, and so um, it is it is um, an important part of of qualitative research. Um, uh, one goal is to understand what actions mean to people. Why do we take the actions that we take? Uh, and then to identify rules that guide um, communication in a given social setting, if we're talking specifically about um, communication uh, research, uh, communication qualitative research. Um, and so the other, uh, this is the wheel of science that we talked about. Uh, in part one of class, and, and uh, when we talked about this, uh, the, the idea was that we could um, use this to better understand the distinction between quantitative and qualitative research. And so, as you recall, quantitative research starts with the theory, and then from our theories and literature review, we develop hypotheses and or research questions. And then we collect our data or make our observations. We observe whatever it is. And then if we're doing quantitative research, it's you know questionnaires or uh, some kind of quantitative data. And then we analyze those observations and make some empirical gen generalizations. And then this leads to us updating our theories. And that, this would be, that would be deductive uh, or deduction which is quantitative. Uh, and so we start with theories and then we move to hypotheses. And so that again, that's uh, deduction or uh, that's the way we do quantitative research. That's the logic that we follow to do quantitative research. Um, qualitative research or inductive logic starts with observations. Uh, there's probably there's there's no need for hypotheses in qualitative research. But they might have some, they might have some vague questions that would be of interest to them. But they're not, they're not, um, they're not sharpened in the same way that a quantitative researcher would sharpen them. They just, 
I'm interested in studying, you know, fill in the blank. Just they just have an interest in understanding some communication context, and um, and and then they start making observations, and those observations could be participant observation. Those uh, observations could be uh, in-depth interviews. Those observations could be some type of social text analysis, or the observations could be for a particular qualitative research project could be all three of those methods that they're combining together in some in some informative way. So we, we start here uh, uh, making our observations and, and qualitative researchers um, just they're not interested in they, they want to understand the phenomena. They want to see the world through the eyes of the participants that they're studying. And they're less interested in in what does what does past research say? What do our theories say? They're just not interested in starting there. They they don't probably, you know, enter the research uh, sort of um, uh, uninformed because that just wouldn't um, be um, you know they're, they're 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 smart people so they're not uninformed but they just they would rather. Um, uh, approach uh, the the situation with a blank slate and then fill it in as they learn about um, uh, their participants. So we, in, in induction or inductive um, logic or qualitative research, we start with the observations and then we are able to analyze our data and summarize our data and make some kind of generalization or generalizations about what it is that we found, uh, you know, giving more concrete answers to whatever research questions we uh, uh, that that develop from our observations, and then from there we generate uh, theoretical uh, uh, understanding that would allow us to to build theories, and so that's induction, which again is qualitative research. So uh, this is review from part one of the class, but just make sure that you uh, are familiar with this for um, this final part of the class, because it is, as I've said before, the better way to distinguish between quantitative and qualitative research. Oftentimes the distinction is, well, quantitative, we're quantifying something, so there's numbers involved. Um, true, but but that, that I think uh, leaves um, a lot um, of um, uh, it just isn't particularly satisfying for me anyway to understand the difference between the two methodologies quantitative and qualitative research a better way to understand that is to understand the logic that the two types of research use and uh, by understanding that logic uh, it gives a, a deeper or richer understanding to to the um, how the research is conducted. So again, quantitative research uses deduction, qualitative research uses induction, and um, and, and those are both important uh, uh, ways to uh, distinguish between quantitative and qualitative research. Um, so this is review. This is what you're going to write your paper on. So I have, we have these four criteria that we use to evaluate quantitative research, and then we're going to look at four criteria that we use to evaluate qualitative research. These are um, uh, really standard uh, at, at this point, I would think. So we have the internal and external validity of the study, and in this case, internal validity is uh, how confident are we that the independent variable led to the changes in the dependent variable. Um, and um, external validity is how generalizable are your results? Do they, are they applicable to other contexts or other people? And so you're going to evaluate your quantitative uh, study on these two criteria. And remember, if you're evaluating an experimental study, this is important. If you're evaluating a, an experimental study, it needs to do really well on internal validity and probably won't do as well on external validity because uh, when we do experimental research it, excuse me it's just difficult to uh, have that um, 
uh, uh, context or to get uh, you know representative samples of people to participate in our in our uh, studies and in fact if we try to um, have both strong internal validity and strong external validity um, we will if we're doing an experimental study and we really want to make have strong external validity almost inevitably your internal validity is going to suffer so if you're reviewing an, uh, an experimental study for the paper it needs to nail it needs to uh, nail internal validity uh, but may not have to have uh, really strong external validity. That's why oftentimes with experimental research and communication we use undergraduate students as our participants because we're less interested in being able to generalize to the entire uh, you know, population. Uh, uh, likewise, if you're reviewing a study that's a survey, it needs to, they use this, they use survey methodology, they need to nail external validity and you wouldn't expect the internal validity to be as strong. It just, it's just uh, uh, not the focus of, of the study. So make sure that you understand which of the two methodologies, experimental or survey, is strong and internal or external validity, and then apply those in, in a meaningful way to the, to the studies that you're, that you're reviewing. Um, and then the other two criteria, and these apply to both, these apply equally to both uh, internal, I'm sorry, to both experimental research and survey research. Uh, if we're measuring something, we care about reliability. We care about consistently being able to measure that thing. And, and if you just think about the idea of, of, of uh, measuring something, if we can't consistently get the same results all else being equal, then we just shouldn't have much confidence in uh, our, our measurement uh, device that that we're that we're using. Likewise, um, uh, validity is how accurate is our measurement. Uh, are we measuring what it is that we say we're measuring? And um, uh, these are both. Um, important criteria uh, and as we've talked about uh, in the past um, reliability is a pretty straightforward thing to assess uh, it's a, usually a quantitative number that we can apply to um, our measures to say was it reliable was it consistent or not validity on the other hand is a more nuanced um, uh, logical argument that the researcher has to make to, to you know, to, to, to persuade, to convince readers that the measures that were used are in fact accurate. I am measuring what it is that I say that, that I'm measuring. So uh, make sure that you are assessing both reliability and validity for um, paper number two. And so I think it's I think it's important to talk about uh, these four criteria: internal validity, and external validity, and measurement reliability and measurement validity. Even if we weren't writing paper number two, because I think it's a good review, uh, because we also have four criteria that we use to evaluate uh, qualitative research, and it's it's just somewhat um, helpful to um, to compare and contrast those. So for qualitative research. Um, one of the criteria that we use is called credibility, and, and this is the idea, do the study's conclusions, after the researcher has done the, the research and, and, and probably started analyzing to a, a large degree uh, their data, uh, uh, the, the researcher would oftentimes bring the results or conclusions or some of the conclusions of the study to the actual people that were being studied and just get get their feedback. Does this seem like I'm on target or does do my results somehow seem off base? And, and so it, it is just a very um, um, typical uh, part of the qualitative uh, research experience. You collect your data, 
you probably start analyzing that data and you're kind of analyzing the data as you're collecting it as well. It's hard not to. Um, but then at some point we asked some of the people that were being studied, hey, do these results ring true for you? And to the extent that our participants uh, confirm, yeah, this does really um, seem like you've described us well. This is this is um, uh, something that that is true. Uh, we would say that the uh, we sorry we would say that the the uh, results are credible um, and or have credibility. So that's the first criteria for um, uh, qualitative research evaluation. The second criteria is what we call uh, uh, dependability, and here we're concerned with the results being trackable. Uh, in some, there, there needs to be uh, something there so some outsider could at least follow this interpretive process that the researcher goes through. They might not come to the same interpretations because it is interpretive, but they need to be able to follow the process across time. And, and so it just needs to be, it, it, there just has to be something, the researcher can't just collect their data and then uh, uh, throw out here are my results without uh, some expectation uh, or some description of, of how they came to those results. And, and that's where this, 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 this trackable process uh, would likely get described in, in, some, uh, in some detail, although not, not in every detail. And so dependability is, are the results based on some trackable process? Or are the results, do they seem like they come out of thin air? Because obviously uh, they wouldn't be very dependable if they appeared just to come out of thin air. Uh, confirmability is the third criteria that we use to evaluate qualitative research, and, and in this case, we're just more interested in the logic that the researcher used, uh, uh, from moving from the data that they collected to the uh, specific results that they're, they're reporting from their data. Uh, again, it has, to, it has to have some um, um, it has to have some, um, uh, you know, it, ha they have to be, it has to be coherent. Uh, there has to be some systematic way that the researcher uh, look through the data. There has to be, you know, it has to be explicit in terms of uh, some of the, you know, the results that are being reported. In other words, are the results well reasoned? Again, it's 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 similar to dependability in that we we just can't the results just can't seem to have you know landed uh, on paper from another planet. They have to have come from the data and and the reader uh, or it's incumbent on the researcher to provide the reader with 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 details so they feel that the results are well reasoned. And then finally it's the idea of transferability and um, and um, in, in the case of transferability um, most researchers, qualitative researchers, they're not interested in external validity or making their claims generalizable. It's just not something that it's just not something that is a part of their scope of what they're interested in doing. Um, but what they do tend to do is they're, they're interested in this idea of transferability, that is, uh, giving the readers enough information and then let, let readers determine to what extent the results apply to different contexts or different groups. And so are the results transferable um, is similar to that uh, the idea of external validity for, for quantitative research, but it but it's not nearly it's not nearly um, as uh, it, it's 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 different in that the the reader uh, is the person who makes those judgments. So if I read 
a qualitative study about um, some workplace, um, some workplace uh, organizational communication phenomena. And if I read that study and I would, I could then make judgments about, well, what other organizations would this apply to? Or does this only apply to the context of the organization that, that was being studied? And so uh, th that's, that's the idea of transferability. So that's the fourth, that's the fourth um, criteria. And so um, I'm going to um, uh, give you uh, this in-class assignment to do here. And really what you'll be able to do is use the information from the slides that we just covered for the most part. Or you could use your textbook if you felt like you needed to. But I want you to write a short paragraph. And a short paragraph to me is uh, five to, you know, 10 sentences, probably not uh, any more than that. A short paragraph that highlights the main differences between quantitative and qualitative research. And we just, we just looked at um, a, a number of those, and you can review uh, those um, from your textbook if you need to. So a short paragraph, uh, uh, somewhere between five and 10 sentences, what are the main differences between quantitative and qualitative research? And you're going to use uh, the um, uh, Dropbox that I have set up for this that will close at 9 o'clock um, tonight. And so um, just make sure that you have it submitted by 9 p.m. tonight so that you get uh, credit for this in-class assignment. And so on um, the 28th, we will start with participant observation, and we'll spend some time talking about participant observation. Everybody have a safe and um, and uh, relaxing Thanksgiving holiday, and we'll see you on the 28th.